Good morning. The Committee on General Government Operations, Federal, Foreign, and Regional Affairs now convenes this hearing. For the record, today is Wednesday, March 7, 2018, and the time is now 10.33 a.m. In accordance with the Open Government Law, public notices for today's proceedings were provided to senators, stakeholders, and our local media. A five-day notice was provided on Wednesday, February 28, 2018, and a 48-hour notice was provided on Monday, March 5, 2018. <clears throat> the public notice was also published in the Guam Daily Post and the Guam Legislature website. Today we will hear and accept testimony, both oral and written, on the following items. Bill number 219-34, introduced by Vice Speaker Therese M. Terlahi and Senator Dennis Rodriguez. I'm going to pause at this moment because we have a request from the prime sponsor uh, for a postponement of this particular bill. However, um, the request we received did not afford us the time necessary for us to communicate it to the public, and I wanted to find out if any members of the public were present to offer testimony on Bill 219. If there are no members of the public present to offer testimony on Bill 219 at this time, I will take the Chairman's prerogative to uh, honor the request of the Prime Sponsor and we will postpone the hearing on Bill 219. For the remainder of the agenda, we have on uh, Bill 247-34 COR, introduced by Senator Frank Uggen Jr., an act to add a new Chapter 1A to Title 5 of Guam Code Annotated, to repeal Sections 1800 <clears throat> of Chapter 18, Title 1, Guam Code Annotated, to repeal sections 4207 of Article 2, Chapter 4, Title 4, Guam Code Annotated. To repeal Chapter 11, Title 5, Guam Code Annotated, relative to establishing education, health, and public safety as the top priorities of the government. To, re to, re to recognizing the governor's authority to reorganize the executive branch of the government. To removing impediments to reorganization. To providing the governor the tools necessary for such reorganization and prioritization and for other purposes and to cite this act as the Government Priorities Act of 2018. Also on the agenda, we have Resolution 310-34 COR introduced by myself, Senator Michael Sinicholas, relative to respectfully petitioning the United States Congress pursuant to, 18, to 48 U.S.C. Section 1423K to enact legislation amending the Organic Act of Guam to include a provision of Guam Public Law 2674 for the Government of Guam to deposit a required percentage of tax collections into the Guam Income Tax Refund Efficient Payment Trust Fund for the payment of income tax refunds and that any such amendment be, re be referenced as the Vicente C. Pangolinan Amendment. Resolution number 312-34 CR, also introduced by myself, Senator Michael Sinicholas, relative to respectfully petitioning the United States Congress pursuant to 48 U.S.C. 1423K to enact legislation amending the Organic Act of Guam to include a provision of Guam Public Law 24-222 such that any provision enacted by the government of Guam which increases the public indebtedness of the government of Guam by at least $25 million, backed by the full faith and credit of the government of Guam, must be approved by a majority votes cast in an election before any such borrowing may be undertaken with allowances for a state of, of emergency, if so ratified by a two-thirds vote of the Guam legislature. Those are the items that we have on today's agenda. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my colleagues who are present. To my immediate left, I have Senator Frank Ogan, Jr. To his immediate left, Senator Will Castro, and to his immediate left, our Vice Speaker, Therese Terlahi. To my immediate right, I have Legislative Secretary, Regine bisco -Lee. To her immediate right, Senator Tilina Nelson. To her immediate right, Senator Luis Munya. Thank you, Senators, for joining us this morning. We will go ahead and begin with Bill Number 247-34, and I now yield to the Prime Sponsor for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to uh, personally thank you for scheduling this particular public hearing. And to those who are providing testimony this morning, thank you very much for joining us and, and providing your comments and your perspective with regards to this measure. Bill 247-34 establishes education, health, and public safety as the top priorities of the government of Guam by providing the governor the tools necessary to prioritize, reorganize, and stabilize our government without raising taxes. By outsourcing, privatization, eliminating redundancies, absorption of functions, prioritization of personnel, and appropriations, we can significantly reduce spending. It is through these processes that we will see real savings and real growth over time. Bill number 247-34 simplifies the multitude of statutes, rules, regulations, and policies that have proliferated over the years, the primary effect of which has made reorganization difficult. The Act authorizes the Governor to implement necessary measures by means of an executive order. The executive orders must be consistent with the merit system, 
provide employees and the public's right to be heard and recognizes the employee's right to due process and right to representation under the Public Employee Management Relations Act of Guam where applicable. We are in the midst of crisis, but I do not believe raising taxes and placing the burden on our people is the answer. I do believe that we must be responsible stewards of these taxpayer dollars, and this measure is reflective of that. Again, thank you all for coming this morning and sharing your thoughts and concerns with us. I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Uggen. Signed up to testify on Bill 247-34. We have Senator Klitsky, Mr. Ken Leon Guerrero, Mr. Andre Bainham, Mr. Steve Hattori, and Ms. Kathy Gogui. If any of these individuals would like to testify, please join us at the table. Uh, we do have um, first to sign up Senator Bob Klitsky. Senator Klitsky may begin at any time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Chairman Mike San Nicholas and honorable members of the Committee on General Governmental Operations, etc. Today I testify in favor of this bill, but am not asking that Bill 247-34 pass. The provisions of this bill will provide the long-term structural reconstruction necessary to avoid the mindset that got us where we are today and the <clears throat> provisions of this bill can provide an effective, efficient government that provides basic services in accordance with the rule of law on at least a break-even basis. I like that sentence so well I'm going to read it again. Provide an effective, efficient government that provides basic services in accordance with the rule of law on at least a break-even basis. Some people may not want to do that, but the question that immediately follows if someone doesn't want to do it is who's going to pay for it? And that's why we're here today. We borrowed a billion dollars to pay for something other than that cost-efficient government that provides basic services. <clears throat> Up until now, our government was devoted to priorities. We emphasized priorities. We paid homage to priorities. We enacted laws for priorities. We appropriated money for priorities. The only problem was that everything was a priority, thus nothing was a priority. Enacting this bill will show your constituents what your priorities really are. And as you can see, the group-run agencies consisting of health, education, and public safety are set out there black and white. That's group one, health, education, public safety. The identification of group one aids in several governmental functions, for instance, budgeting, personnel management, recruitment, and of course, layoffs, furloughs, rifts, and other functions suggesting prioritization. When government initiatives are considered, the effect on group one can be the litmus, for example, should $400,000 be spent to send a soccer team to a tournament? If so, what's the impact on Group 1? How about $810,000, $810,147 for a government holiday? That's what the Director of Administration said Monday cost us this week, 810147 bucks. The day after Thanksgiving, when the people who pay the bills around here, the folks down, at, down in Tuman, the guys that drive the buses, cook, check people in at the hotels, clean up the rooms, etc., they don't get the day after Thanksgiving off. They don't even get Thanksgiving off. 24-7, 365 days a week for them. But government employees got the day after Thanksgiving off 
and it cost us $810,147. And again, as per the testimony, how does that affect group one? How does that help us with education? How did that 800 grand help us with Guam Memorial Hospital? Did it put more cops on the street? I don't think so. How about the South Pacific Games? FESPAC, over $300,000 worth of executive security for the governor, lieutenant governor, and the first lady, which, contrary to what Chief Cruz told the Post, is not required by law. Chief Cruz said, well, it's required by law. It ain't. It's not required by law. Perhaps there's a requirement from somewhere else that Chief Cruz do it, but it's not in the law. Now let's take the budgeting process as an example. A standard budget for Group 1, health, education, public safety, could be introduced, debated, passed, and sent to the governor. The legislature could then go through the same drill for Group 2 and whatever remains would be allocated to group three, the governor to use a 100% transfer authority to allocate the money amongst the group three parts of the government. This procedure avoids the rather unsightly spectacle provided by the legislature working a single budget for the entire government where each item appears, repeating the words, appears of equal weight. Thus the practice has been that if a senator would increase an appropriation what, to what should be recognized as a priority, the cry arise, immediately arises from a backbencher, what are you going to cut? Budgeting for priorities shouldn't be seen as a zero-sum game with the entire government on the other end of the scale from real priority functions. Enacting this bill starts you down that road. Section uh, 2203 and following allow the governor to develop a governmental structure to replace the haphazard ad hoc governmental structure that metamorphosed after 1950. You know, the government just grew. We added a department here, a bureau there, a section here. There was no master plan, and, and, and that's the way governments tend to go. They just tend to tend to take on a life of their own and are self-generating. But this would be a perfect time to stop and say, what do we got, what do we need, and how best to organize it? The Organic Act gives the governor the responsibility to organize or reorganize the government, but not in the face of statute. Over the years, the uncontrollable urge to pander to government employees erected so many roadblocks as to make reorganization impossible. The complexity encountered to reorganize the entire government probably exceeds the design capability of any legislature. No, no, no problem there. It's a tough job. It would be a tough job for, for a small committee dedicated to nothing else but to try to take it through the popular branch of the government of Guam with competing interests. I don't think it can be done. It's a job for the governor. Enacting the provisions of this bill probably involves a fair amount of legislative quibbling. For instance, just as an example, does the library belong in, in group one? Uh, should the Bureau of Budget and Management Research be in group two? I, I have a feeling that someone from the Public Defender Service Corporation 
might have his idea as to where that agency should fit. And that's good because that is actually the beginning of the reorganization process. Somebody's got to decide what is priority and what isn't. So uh, I looked at Senator Rogan's bill and the bill that I looked at was, was just words on paper. I didn't get the one where anything is engraved in stone or etched in copper or something like that. So I suspect that there's room to deal with the three, with the groups to make sure that everyone, when, when this bill, when these provisions become law, everyone is satisfied that these truly are our priorities in a hierarchical setup. So there's a little room to, to quibble there. And there's a caveat, and that is that whatever the governor does when, this, when these provisions become law, let's see. Well, on the right day, seven of you guys could do away with it if he signed the bill. I think you can go all the way down to what, four nowadays? But uh, and under any circumstance, 10 senators have all the power. 10 senators could pass a bill to set aside what the governor did and revoke his veto. So the, what, what I present here as a caveat is not necessarily a caveat. Perhaps it's more along the lines of a safety belt. If you're wondering if the governor, if we give this power to the governor and he goes somewhere where we don't want him to go, what can we do? And the answer is, you can pass laws. That's the supreme power in our government. Testimony on bills 248 and 5X, as you were 5S, will explicate upon the parliamentary acrobatics necessary to make a tax increase barely palatable to cynics like me. And uh, Andre's not here this morning, but uh, I'm going to plagiarize a little bit. When it comes to tax increases and nothing else, I say no way. Because I think what people are looking for is this. Got to do more than just get past the current crisis. There has to be something put in place that will that will stop whatever it is that we've been doing to get here, and will be the long-term fix. So if the long-term fix comes along with a small small tax increase, close sunset, even I might say it's okay. My my gigantic block of voters. Uh, Anyhow, um, testimony on bills 245, as you were, 248 and 5X will explicate upon the parliamentary acrobatics necessary to make a tax increase barely pal palatable even to cynics like me. Let's call it the Missouri Maneuver. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Klitsky. Um, next, we have um, Mr. Ken Leonguero. Ken, anytime. Thank you very much. I would, Andre Bynum has asked me to read his testimony, and the reason I agreed to do that is he and many, many, many other people would have liked to have been able to testify on this bill, but as you know, it's at 1030 and they're at work. And that's one of the problems we have with the processes here. So, uh, in reading Andre Bynum's bill, I want you to know that he has talked to many, many, many people before he formed his opinion, as have I before I formed mine. So, good morning, and thank you for allowing the public to be heard today and my testimony to be read in support of Bill 247. For years, we have seen this government grow beyond its purpose. We have seen agency after agency created to provide jobs as political paybacks to supporters without the slightest regard for the true purpose of government. Thomas Jefferson said, the purpose of government is to enable the people to live safely and to provide common for the common welfare. 
Government exists for the governed, not the governors. With that in mind, Bill 247 begins the process of changing the way our public servants and its people understand the role of government, not as an employment agency, but as an institution that provides necessary services to the people. It prioritizes services over jobs and the welfare of all over the welfare of the connected. Once Bill 247 passes into law, it can create a long-term strategy for dealing with our current financial crisis by allowing the public servants to prioritize health, safety, and education, shrinking our government to a manageable size. This must be done before any new tax increases are levied against an already overburdened people. So I support Bill 247-34 and encourage this body to pass the bill and be the legislature that puts an end to the status quo. Thank you, Andre Bynum, teacher and resident of Talafofo. Uh, like Andre, I have been talking with a lot of people and I think that I've captured their, their feelings in my testimony. This bill is timely because we are at a pivotal point in the political development of Guam. We the people have survived so far numerous attempts recently by Adeloupe to balance the budget by increasing the tax burden on the people. No attempt to raise taxes will be successful until government of Guam makes an effort to dramatically increase the efficiency of government operations. We are in a mess of our own making when our leaders choose to go to blindly ignore the warning signs of financial trouble ahead. And those of us old enough to remember the simple typing class exercise, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their country. That time is now. It's time for Adeloup and the legislature to do the hard work that has been avoided so far and to put our government back on solid ground. We have to do this now because the impact of the, tra the Trump tax cuts had on government of Guam revenues and I believe the Trump federal budget cuts are going to have even a bigger impact on Guam revenues and not in a good way. We also have to do this because the financial storm clouds are building on both sides of the Pacific and Guam has the dubious distinction of joining an impressive list of countries in the region on credit watch by the various monitoring agencies and the International Monetary Fund. I'm talking about countries like China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan that Guam is counting on to bolster our tourism industry. So whether we like it or not, Guam is vulnerable to potential chaos caused by financial storms on coming from both directions. The concept of the invisible hand is explained by Adam Smith in his book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, refers to the indirect and direct benefits society receives from the operations of a free market economy. The problem here on Guam is we don't have a free market economy. On Guam, the free market is a myth because government expenditures are 48% of the local economy. By comparison, government expenditures are 13% in Hawaii, 9% in Puerto Rico, 8% in Texas. And for those of you following Colorado, government expenditures have dropped down to 6.75% of the Colorado economy. In most states, government spending is the tail. Here, government expenditures are the dog. Economics is a numbers game, and on Guam we have three legs to our economy. Government expenditures, the largest, number one. Tourism and small business. So for comparison purposes, Puerto Rico's economy has nine legs. Manufacturing, finance, construction, import-export, tourism, mining, fishing, agriculture, and government. We have a small economy. Our population is stagnant. We are pretty stable around 160,000 people. We do not have large annual influxes of new residents that transfer all the wealth from their former residents to Guam. 
In California, six per, they have a 6% growth rate. Texas has a 13% growth rate. Florida has an 11% growth rate. And Hawaii has a 5% growth rate. One third of our population are children. One third of our population are in retirement or nearing retirement. That leaves around 53,000 people in their per peak earning years. So for comparison purposes, Puerto Rico's population is 3.4 million. 22% of their population are school-aged children. 21% of their population is retired or nearing retirement. That leaves 57% of their population, 1.9 million in their peak earning years. Guam doesn't benefit from the invisible hand because we don't have a true free market economy. We are an isolated economy geographically. Local businesses compete against subsidized tax-free sales on base. Local residents compete against government subsidized military and Section 8 housing for rental. And as an example, a friend of mine who had a duplex in Jigo who normally rented it out to local residents took out an equity loan and he is jacking the rent up to $1,850 a month to capture that subsidized military rent. So now we have two families who are going to be competing against military and Section 8 housing because they make, unfortunately for them, they make too much money to qualify for Section 8 and other government aid programs. So they're joining a growing population that is displaced by the uh, government economy. Um, any money put back into our pockets by the recent tax cuts has already been consumed by the increased fuel taxes, the increased government utility rates, and uh, rampant price inflation across the board. Because we have a small population and economy, raising taxes is not going to solve government of Guam's revenue prices crisis. The people don't have the ability to absorb a tax increase any more than the government of Guam is able to absorb the, the tax, the Trump tax cut. A lot of people have demanded that government budgets be slashed to the bone to escape the current financial crisis. The problem with wholesale slashing of government operations would result in a parallel slashing in the non-government economy. That's because we don't have a true free market and we don't have that lift provided by the invisible hand to generate funds needed for our government. So we're going to have to depend on politicians to fix government of Guam. Uh, Guam Citizens for Public Accountability supports the intent and purpose of Bill 247 because both the executive and the legislative branches need to work together to navigate government of Guam out of its current financial crisis without doing massive damage to the island's fragile economy. Politicians are going to have to operate with a scalpel, not with a chainsaw. Rash, bold actions, not carefully thought out, will do twice the damage with half the effort to our fragile economy. This bill provides tools politicians are going to need to pare down expenses by improving vital operations, closing down operations and programs that have outlived their usefulness with the goal of reducing the cost of government operations through increased efficiency rather than wholesale cutting a payroll. Another tool in your arsenal just waiting to be used, and it could be the most powerful tool in your arsenal, is Public Law 2379, introduced by Senators Carlotta Leon Guerrero, Ted Nelson, and Tony Bloss. And it was passed unanimously. It's called the Government Incentive Award Act, and mirrors a program that has been used by the federal government many states successfully. In just one example alone, 13 Army civilian employees received incentive award checks of $6.5 million because the ideas they submitted to improve operations and processes will save the Department of Defense more than $20 billion a year. 
Now I can testify to this as well because as a consultant, I had all my clients send out a letter to all their employees letting them know that conversations with me were treated as confidential such as that between a doctor and a patient. And many of the ideas that I presented to my clients were ideas that came from their own employees that helped them make dramatic reductions in their cost of operations and improve profitability. I focus on that point because it's 10 times easier to save a penny than it is to get a penny. And I think the uh, public response to proposed tax, tax increases is proof of that. Public Law 2379 combined with the bills, the tools in Bill 247 would could be the prescription needed to bring government and Guam operations into the 21st century and serve as a model for the rest of the government operations because government as a whole is going to have to learn how to do more with less and get better faster. The task before politicians is not an easy one nor the one that will be accomplished in a few days. But the work needs to be done, and more importantly, it needs to be done correctly because of the intertwined relationship between government and private eco economies, it needs to be done well. My hope is that by now, our politicians have learned to pay attention to the first sign of financial storm clouds on the horizon and not wait until our noses are barely above water, as happened with the Trump tax cuts. Only by executing real and meaningful reorganization in a systematized and controlled manner to reduce expenses will politicians have the credibility to propose any new or increased taxes at a later date. Increasing taxes now without a good faith effort underway first to reorganize the government of Guam looks to the people like we're handing cash to a drug addict hoping they will use it to pay for rehabilitation. That concludes my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Leonguero. Mr. Hattori. Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairperson St. Nicholas, uh, committee members. My name is Stephen Hattori. I'm the director for the Public Defender Service Corporation, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify on Bill 247-34. This act gives the governor the tools necessary to reorganize and prioritize uh, the executive branch. Okay, thank you. In reviewing the bill, we were quite surprised that the Guam Public Defender Service Corporation was included within the executive branch. Historically, we've always been attached to the Judiciary for Administration. Uh, nationwide public defender firm uh, companies are uh, attached to the judiciary. We were even more dismayed when we uh, realized that our priority number was 332, the lowest uh, priority on the list. Uh, based on our understanding of the proposed bill, the Guam Public Defender Ser Service Corporation would stand the risk of being reorganized or abolished and all within the, um, really up to the governor. And this is really surprising because we're the only agency in Guam that provides, the, you know, the constitutional protections required uh, by the uh, the Constitution. Now, uh, Chairman St. Nicholas, no disrespect to your intentions to help balance Gov Guam's budget. And the Public Defender Service Corporation, we are going to participate in this process. We have already engaged in cost saving measures. But to include PSC as part of this bill would be detrimental to the people we represent. For example, when we were collecting d data to help justify our desire to lift the corporation's moratorium on civil matters, we came across data showing that for, on Guam, one in every 3.4 residents receives food stamps. In addition to this data, Gura and the Guam Homeless Coalition stated that for the same year, 2015, the highest group of homeless people were Chamorros. Having data from both these sources should prove, provide this body with some sort of indication of the clients we serve and the residents who stand the chance of not being represented so through the judicial system as a result of the Public Defender Service Corporation's priority placement in Bill 247. I know that I noticed Prosecution Division was uh, in priority one. And the way that the justice system works, and you guys are all familiar with it, every time a case is filed 
an, an individual is charged with a crime, an attorney, if you're not a, able to afford one, is appointed to represent you. If the Public Defender Service Corporation were abolished, the entire judicial system would, uh, would pretty much come to a stop. While most people may not understand the public defender's importance in our community, we need to remind one another of the constitutional rights of every individual in our territory, regardless of their income level. We are all entitled to a fair criminal justice system and the right to be defended by competent and effective lawyers. To minimize the importance of PDSC in our justice system brings us decades back to the landmark 1963 case of Gideon versus Wainwright. Through our Gideon mandate, we are mandated by the Constitution to ensure that any person hailed into court who is too poor to hire a lawyer cannot be assured a fair trial unless counsel is provided for him. No other agency or department in the entire government provides this mandated service. Uh, Chairman Sinicholas, as you have served in the legislature, and Chair Senator Uggen, as uh, you were formerly the chair for the judiciary for close to a decade, uh, you all realize the value that the Public Defender Service Corporation plays in our community. In fact, in most states, in every jurisdiction, uh, public defender service corporations exist uh, throughout the nation as uh, mandated by the Constitution. What every person should appreciate, though, is that the Public Defender's Office, in addition to representing people individually, also provides a system of checks and balances on the criminal justice system as a whole. It guarantees that no agency, whether that be the Attorney General's Office or the Guam Police Department, is allowed to operate unchallenged and unquestioned. The attorneys at the Guam Public Defender Service Corporation seek to ensure that the rights of individuals are not whittled away to the point that the goals of the Constitution are not realized. Senators, we realize that GovGuam's current finances are dire. However, we know that it is equally important that we, there be fairness within Guam's judicial system. Our adversarial system of law necessitates that we provide adequate assistance of counsel to anyone accused of a crime who cannot afford his or her own representation. An indigent, even one accused of committing a heinous crime, still has a right to the presumption of innocence and to a fair trial in which he or she can proffer defense to the charges leveled against them. Without access to counsel, which we believe 247 may create, it may cause an innocent individual to be convicted of a crime merely because they happen to be poor. We have been in contact with DOA. We have agreed to a reduced allotment schedule. We have implemented a hiring freeze and we've cut uh, as many administrative costs as we, we are capable of. That being said, we urge that you reconsider PDSC's inclusion in this bill and that you understand that we provide to your constituents a fundamental right, a right guaranteed by the Constitution, a right that every Chamorro or Guamanian is afforded to in Guam. We are, once again, we are the only governmental entity tasked with this constitutional duty. Thank you for your time, and on behalf of our indigent con constituents, we ask that the bill be amended to remove uh, reference to the Public Defender Service Corporation. Thank you, Attorney Hattori. Just to clarify, I'm, I'm not the author of the bill. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just <laughs> chairing the, I'm just the chairman of the committee. <laughs> but um, I, I do agree with your sentiments. I think that perhaps um, uh, we can work with the chair to uh, ensure that, uh, that that particular agency is considered more as a judicial function than, than an executive branch and, uh, function. We understand. Senator Ruggins has always been 100% supportive of right, our, right. our office. And, so. and that's why um, I appreciate the, the testimony of um, Senator Bob when he says that this is writing on paper, it's not etched in stone. We're going to be able to definitely um, do a once over, or twice okay. over, or three times over to make sure that right. everything is uh, where you. it's supposed to be. Senator Ugan, any um, closing statements or colleagues, any questions? Senator thank you very much, uh, Senator Sir Nicholas, and thank you again for having a public hearing on this measure. Uh, Senator Klitschke, Mr. Leongaro, and uh, Attorney Otori, thank you for providing your testimony this morning. You know, I, I understand that there are 14 other minds in the legislature that will, uh, once this legislation is presented on the floor, will be able to make contributions. And I appreciate the perspective you're sharing uh, and you're providing, Attorney Otori. The, the issue here and the, and the underlying approach here is to find greater efficiencies. If it means working with Public Defender Service Corporation, and if, if in fact there's a complementary function, 
out there in the community so that we can increase efficiency and provide more resources so that your agency can further assist those who are in need. Certainly, that would accomplish the objective behind this proposal. And the idea, once again, is not only to look at reorganizing the government. We need to streamline because it's okay to have all of your personnel, but if you don't have the necessary tools and equipment, whether it's computers, access to the law library, or, or whatever additional operational expenses are required for you and your people to do the best job you possibly can, then it's to no avail in terms of looking at streamlining, realizing some cost reductions, and ensuring that these resources go to where they should be. And the bill highlights where it should be in education, public safety, and health care. And certainly, uh, the services you provide is recognized as critical also in, in the operations of the government of Guam. So I am not dismissing that. I just okay. want to make sure that as we move forward, that myself and my colleagues, that we're always mindful that the end goal is streamlining the government of Guam, realizing some cost reductions, and making sure that we can empower and retool uh, our public employees so that they can have the resources and and most importantly, which is fundamental to this piece of legislation, is ensuring that we prioritize education, public safety, and health care. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Thank Chairman, you, can I make a, one observation? Uh, on the, the various bills to raise uh, the business privilege tax, we had every director, agency director, deputy director in here justifying why those taxes should be raised and I am shocked, literally shocked. I expected this to be a circus, I really did. I expected to have this room packed with de directors, deputy directors and employees justifying why their uh, agency or department should continue to exist. And the fact that we only have one agency standing here because I was looking forward to seeing how the decolonization, the Guam Energy Office, and many other what I refer to as tits on a book, uh, board uh, justify their existence, and they aren't here. So maybe as you, when you uh, mark up the bill, you should uh, take serious consideration to the fact that none of government of Guam's department of agencies, except for the one that defends the people, who don't have any money came here to justify their existence and use that as a uh, ranking mechanism when it comes to funding. Just an observation because they were so quick to pack this place to demand that we the people give them more of our money but I find them egregiously delinquent in defending why they should continue to receive any of our money. So noted Mr. Younger. Um, any of my other colleagues, uh, Senator Lee, I understand you have some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, gentlemen, for being here and for continuing to participate in our process. Um, my question is primarily directed to you, Senator Klitsky, and Mr. Leon Guerrero. Do you concur with this priority listing? And if not, are there any things that you would move around from group one to group two? or? If, is, are there, were there any changes that you would recommend if you were sitting in our chairs? If I were sitting in your chair, I would be sensitive to the movement of agencies from one category to another that would ensure the passage of this bill, Senator. There are many judgment calls involved. I would like to think that I could make them all and they would all be 100% correct, but um, I'm so proud of my humility that I could tell you that I couldn't do that. Thank you. Mr. Leongaro. Um This is where the operate with a scalpel as opposed to a chainsaw comes in because what you need to do, and first right off the bat you need to chastise very loudly and very publicly every agency that wasn't here today because I'm going to <laughs> and the, the answer to your question is this you need to do a hell of a lot of research before you start making the cuts because 
because of the delicate nature of the economy. So I'll just use one example of how this could be done. There's no reason every department, every agency, every autonomous agency needs a personnel department. If we had one personnel department for government of Guam, take all the people now that are excess personnel, retrain them, reassign them over to Department of Revenue and Tax. Now that accomplishes three things. One, more effective utilization of a vital resource without increasing the social welfare burden on the local economy. Two, revenue and tax is the money collecting agency for government of Guam. More, more people there and less special assistance at Adaloop is a good balance, you see, because the special assistance at Adaloop consume money. Uh, the transfer of personnel generate money. So as you do this delicate little dance, you're going to be looking, how do we take people from becoming uh, expense consumers to revenue generators? And revenue generation takes many forms. It's not just collecting revenue, because if we were to take those people and move them to revenue and tax, then we would reorganize revenue tax and make it a 21st century operation. It would be open from 7 o'clock in the morning till 7 o'clock at night, Tuesday through Friday, and from 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock Saturday. Why? So people have more opportunity to come in and give government money without taking money out of the pockets of small businesses. Because if I was working at an assistant manager at McDonald's and I needed to get a new license or register a car or to pay my property tax, I'd have to take off and now I lose income and my business that I work for loses income because I'm not there. So this is a very delicate dance and this is what I used to do as a living in the community. You know, I was a profitability consultant. I'd go into businesses, show them how to become more profitable. Government is a business. And you become more profitable by making effective use of the resources you already have rather than try to raise prices, which is the taxing. So you've got a list right here but based on the interest from the government entities you guys have a hard fight ahead of you because if they aren't willing to come here and justify their existence maybe they don't need to exist we can do without a lot of agencies but what do we do with the people that becomes the question we have a lot of vacancies at department of administration i mean at uh, department of education a lot of vacant teacher positions I still don't understand why we need five vice principals at every high school, and I don't know how many vice principals we have down the line, but I do know we have a lot of vacancies on the floor. The primary mission of the Department of Education is to educate children. Let's take vice principals and put them back in the classroom. We reduce the cost by, I think, vice principals with their full pack are like at 140, 160. What are teachers getting? They're not getting 140 and 160. So we reduce the cost. Will the vice principals go willingly? Hell no, they'll go kicking and screaming, but what's the alternative? Going over to McDonald's and applying for a job for the evening shift? So they'll go down there. There is no progress without friction, and in an, in an adventure like this, there is no friction without pain. The question is, where is the greatest pain going to be? Is it going to be on people like me? I mean, I'm hurting already from that gas increase. I'm hurting already because of the utility increase, and now you want to make the cost of everything go up, and then we have the tariff, so the cost of everything's going to go up again. Or are we going to make 20 vice principals unhappy? Because now instead of getting 140,000 a year plus with everything, they're only going to get 65,000 a year. I feel for them, I really do. But the alternative is all the people who are living from paycheck to paycheck, having their life suck more. So you know it's a numbers game. As you do this, who do we how many what is the biggest number we're going to irritate? Try to avoid that and irritate the smallest number of people possible. 
but the goal should always be to improve operations without, uh, without using the chainsaw approach because our economy is only, is too intertwined. I hope that helps. I know it's a you. long answer to a short question. Can, but, can I uh, take another crack at your question? Sure, Senator, Senator please. Th thank you very much. The, um, the really hard work is going to be done by the governor. The initial work, the threshold work will be done here. And that is how you deal with the, the three groups, or maybe you want to have four groups, or maybe two, or whatever, but I think three is a really good place to start. And as Stephen points out, he thinks that perhaps he should be eliminated or placed in a different group. That's the call that you're going to make. How many vice principals are going to be at Leon Guerrero High School? I don't know. That's that's not the name of it. I'm sorry. Uh, that's not your call. I don't even know if it's the governor's call. But at this at this uh, juncture, the thing that you'll be concerned about would be which uh, agency goes in which group and what priority it would have. Uh, certainly one thing I agree with, uh, with uh, Ken on is the fact that nobody's here except for the Public Defender Service Corporation and Stephen told us that he thinks maybe he even shouldn't be here because he should be in the judicial branch. Interesting point. But he's concerned enough to come down here. So with respect to the other 54 directors or how many other, others there are, uh, in a sense it's good that they're not here because they've obviously consented by their absence to the concepts involved in this bill. So uh, I would think that uh, from now on, they're stopped from complaining because they had their opportunity and they were, since we weren't talking about raising taxes or cutting their pay, I guess they weren't interested. So in that sense, uh, Senator, my answer to your question is however you want to do it. Thank you very much, Senator Klitschke. And again, I thank you gentlemen for participating and for, for offering your testimony to the committee. So just want to see it. Thank you, Senator Lee. And thank you for that, Senator Klitschke. If anybody tries to bring them into a committee of the whole, I will say that according to Senator Klitschke, they are stopped from participating. Any of my colleagues have any other questions for um, Vice Speaker Tulai? Good morning. Thank you again for being here. Um, just want to clarify, uh, I mean, I heard all your testimony, but just to be sure, you prefer this process, this executive order process than, than the current reorganization process that's allowed where there's already, I mean, this, this sets up a process where the governor is going to create rules, a whole list of rules on page nine, rules for prioritization, prioritization in force, layoff, furlough, there's a whole list. And then he, by executive order, will uh, declare the absorption of, of the functions of an agency uh, or the abolition of an entity. Uh, and so this, the, the big difference is that I'm seeing, uh, there's a part here where it says they will comply with the current rules of uh, the personnel rules. And, and, but the big difference that I'm seeing and, and the, the sections that are being repealed by this bill are, are really the public hearing and whether the legislature later has any other say in it. But so you agree that after we, the legislature creates the list that the governor just does this by executive order without really any public notice, any other, any other requirement? That's correct. All right, and Mr. Leongaro? I agree because he is the executive branch and we have to look beyond the current administration. We have to recognize that this is going to be a process that's going to have to take place. The government of Guam is going to have to recreate itself constantly, something it has not done. Government of Guam just got fat, but with these tools right here, we have the check is the legislature. 
you control the purse, you know. So if we separate it, we get to the point where we avoid the level of micromanagement by having a group of 15 people overseeing every single direct decision made by the executive branch. And that's the way it should be. You guys set policy. This bill sets a policy. It gives him tools to execute a policy, but you guys control the purse. And you guys have the ability to change the policy if necessary to bring somebody back in line if they go too far. Let's say, for example, Governor Ken decrees that anybody whose last name ends in a consonant is surplus. Is sur um, surplus as a means of reducing the cost of government. Well, obviously that is way over the line. But if I as governor decide that through executive order to eliminate the following department and agencies, that's what you have given him the power to do. Now, the backstop to that is the check and balance system. And that's where the courts come in. So we have to start somewhere. A journey of 10,000 miles begins with the first step. And I'll use an analogy I used to use with my clients. A 747, this shows how old I am, flies across the Pacific. In the old days, once an hour, a navigator would go up into the Astrodome and with his sextant identify where they were and the plane would make radical corrections. Well, with the advent of GPS and computer and autopilot, an airplane corrects course 20 times a minute as opposed to once an hour. So you have more of a straight line course than the zigzag they used to have. That's what we have to become. We have to become an evolving organization. Guam, government of Guam has to be evolve with the times. The fact that we're on an AS-400 in these days is just blows my mind. But you know why we're on an AS-400 now? Instead of some more state-of-the-art architecture? Because the governor made decisions that full employment, I mean, we're looking at 13 special assistants at Adelaide, really? 13 special assistants? Was more important than investing in the technology to make government of Guam more efficient. And I'll, I'll give you an example. One of my clients had an AS400, and you know what his justification was? He had 10 stores in three states. And the reason he was running on AS400, it was paid for. But he also had 16 people in the main store, three people in each one of the 10 stores to make that AS400 work. And once he upgraded to state-of-the-art technology, he had nine people running the entire inf IT infrastructure of the business. So you see, those are the kinds of things that have to be done. The executive is the people to do it. I mean, if you were to give him a budget to buy new computers right now, what would he probably do with it? We'd have five more paydays, uh, government paydays, uh, paid holidays, pardon me. But that's off the point. Your question was, do I agree with it? I agree with the concept, the principle. There is a winnowing process that takes place in the legislation, and I would have hoped that by having more of the government agencies come in here, we would have had that winnowing process, but what it's gonna come down to is on the floor. You 15 are going to work this bill into some type of a format. Will that be the bill carved in stone? No, because what's going to happen is we're going to start this process and three, four, five months from now, there's going to be a whole host of problems that we will have uncovered as we started down this road that are going to require policy, policy changes at your level, funding changes at their level, but you authorize the funding. This is a dance. It's not a one shot. This is a process that's going to go on forever. 
this is just the first step of a journey of 10,000 miles. <laughs> All right, thank you, I appreciate that. I, I agree that the streamlining is really the goal. Um, I just worry about some of the things that you said, for example, you said to absorb, for example, one of these agencies like the Port Authority of Guam, this bill allows it to be absorbed by one of our education, health or public safety agencies or some of their, I can understand some of their duties but, you know, we're giving this blanket authority and without requiring anybody to, to hear the idea and to just give any kind of input on it. Now, that's, I understand the system and maybe, you know, with everything ideal, that's how it should work, that we should trust our executive branch that they're going to make, they're going to do the research that you described also, that it takes a lot of research. We have to really see the... the the impact of what they're doing. And I don't want them to um, experiment, I guess, right? I would like to have all of that up front, all that debate. Your, your, I'm sure you would like to have it say in when, when they decide that it's, it's much more efficient to transfer some of these agencies to another. I just think the more minds that look at it and the more um, critique, and I'm not saying we can we all need to stop it, but, but at least the public that they know in advance that this is what's going to occur, the reasoning behind it, the research that's been put into it, because we have seen, you know, that we do, do, it's not always, I mean, we do leave a lot of these decisions to the executive branch right now, and we're not always happy with the decisions that they've made, and, and then, like you said, we have to dance and do, do more things, but I just think, yeah, the more that they have a process that's open that, that allows for public input is, is going to be better. Well, and the goes, input of the employees who I think know yeah. a lot of what, what's going on. The, th the, the thing that's encouraging about this is we don't have a sleepy population anymore. We have a population that realizes that this is all coming out of our pocket. No longer do people look at government of Guam as this mythical money machine that money just appears magically and jobs are dispensed. Um, the population is a lot more educated than it was and as a result of the pay raises, a lot less trusting in um, politicians. So we, we, we listen to what you say and we look to see if your actions match your words. The points you raised are extremely valid, but this is not going to take place in a vacuum and there will be public oversight through just regular day-to-day -day conversations between people and actions. So I would like to think that the people we have in office and their subordinates are smart enough and especially after what we're going through right now. This is a crucible. This is a high intensity learning process for many government employees who have never had to worry about where their next paycheck is coming because now they're in the private sector because we worry every day where our next paycheck is coming from and now government employees are beginning to recognize hey this is not as safe as it used to be because we don't have the authority to absorb the cost of government the executive ag agencies if if they don't do this right there will be a huge public outcry and your job as senators and oversight will be to receive that public outcry and give guidance. So I'm confident in the check and balances that are in place. I mean, our country is what? Going on 300 years now? Following the same set of check and balances. But what happens is personalities get in the way. We say that on the national scale, but what we're starting to see is we're starting to see the check and balances starting to come back into play as we get closer to that, every two years we get to overthrow the government. So now what we're looking at is, I'm concerned, I'm worried, but I look at it this way. The current administration won't be there forever. 
will there be a better administration come in? I certainly hope so. And I'm not saying that it was a bad administration. I'm just saying that it was an administration that wasn't as careful with the money they received and wasn't as um, foresightful, if that's such a word, because we, they saw the warning signs we've seen and they've had four years to avoid the problem we're in now, but they chose to not take any actions. Well, we in the public are gonna be watching government very closely. I see the levels of transparency going up. This is a perfect example right now. And as we get better and better, I'm talking about we, as we citizens get better and better about demanding and holding our government elected and appointed officials accountable, I think it will go up. But I, I agree with your concerns. You have a right to be concerned. I have a right to be concerned, but we gotta have a little bit of faith until it has been proven wrong. And that's where the safeguards and public opinion come in. I'm gonna trust that the governor, existing governor, will use these tools properly because he, by now I'm sure, has seen that uh, the tax and spend isn't going to go. So I'm hoping that he's learned something. I'm hoping that people who work for him have learned something. I know that you people, this body has evolved and is continuing to evolve, so that's what gives me hope. And I'll try to keep future answers shorter. <laughs> it's just, this is a good philosophy question. It really was. That was a more of a philosophy question. I, I haven't seen a, uh, a filibuster in this new building until now, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> we will make sure we um, save it for posterity so that um, future lawmakers can review it. <laughs> and anyway, colleagues, have any further questions for this panel? Gentlemen, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, absent any further testimony, we'll go ahead and consider bill number 247-34 being heard. We can continue to receive testimony via senatorsnicholas at gmail.com to the committee. Next on the agenda, we have um, resolution number 310-34 introduced by myself. Relative to respectively petitioning the United States Congress to enact legislation to amend the Organic Act to include a provision of Guam Public Law 2674 for the government of Guam to deposit a required percentage of tax collections into the income tax refund efficient payment trust fund for the payment of income tax refunds and that any such amendment be referenced as the Vicente C. Pangolinan am Amendment. The purpose of this resolution, just to um, simplify, is to ensure that um, it's in the Organic Act that the Public Law 2674 um, requirement of depositing money into the refund trust account is actually done so that the money will be there for us to be able to pay tax refunds. Um, right now we're, we're entering the um, season where people are starting to file for their tax refunds and it also just so happens to be in the middle of this financial crisis where it's very, very obvious that tax refund money is not in the tax refund trust account again. This problem is something that's been repeated year in and year out and what's unfortunate is that absent Public Law 2674, there actually is no mandate to put money aside for tax refunds. The way it's supposed to work is the withholding taxes that our people pay is supposed to be put into trust, and those withholding taxes are then supposed to be used to pay tax refunds when tax refunds become due. Unfortunately, this government uh, has developed the, the habit of operating on those withholding taxes. And nowhere is that more evident than today where with the Trump tax cuts affecting withholding taxes, that is the primary impact on the cash flow of this government because those withholding taxes are paid every two weeks with the paychecks of these employees. Those withholding taxes are supposed to be set aside and used to pay tax refunds. It's not. It's used to operate this government. And so there is no funding mechanism for tax refunds, except for Public Law 2674. Unfortunately, this public law never gets followed. And so how do we pay tax refunds if the only funding mechanism for it is not followed? We deficit spend. We take from Section 30 money 
and we spend that money to pay for tax refunds, especially because it's now court ordered. But what does that mean? Section 30 money is paid to the government at the end of September and is supposed to be used for the fiscal year to come. When we use Section 30 money to pay off our tax refund obligation that we've accrued over the course of the prior year, we have therefore uh, uh, spent ourselves into a deficit because that money is no longer available. Ironically, our shortfall today is $67 million. And the amount of Section 30 money that we spent was about $67 million. If we did not spend that Section 30 money for tax refunds, we would not be in the shortfall that we have today. And if we had just made the income tax refund deposits, we would not have had to spend the, that Section 30 money to pay those tax refunds. And so what this resolution seeks to do is ask the Congress to amend our Organic Act to mandate those deposits into the refund trust account so that we can make sure that money is going to be there we stop our deficit spending, and we prevent circumstances like today where we are in a fiscal crisis because we're spending money that's supposed to be used for other purposes. And so I'm respectfully requesting that uh, my colleagues please consider resolution 310-34. Resolution we don't have any individuals that have signed up to testify. Mr. Leon Guerrero, you're still present. Do you have any comments you'd like to add? Yes, I do. Um, I thought long and hard about this resolution and I decided that I'm against this resolution and for this reason. This is the body that controls the purse. And this is the body that needs to change the way you do your budgeting. And my suggestion would be that this body limit budgets to 90% of collections of the previous year and make that a policy. Because if you limit the budget to the 90% of the collections of the previous year, you will have a hard, verifiable number with which to allow appropriations from the administration to take place. Because the way the process works now is I'm the governor, I wake up, I have a vision. I saw a unicorn run across the yard, a government house, and therefore I have decided that $900 million is the budget that I am going to project for the next year based on a unicorn running across the yard, in which case you guys then take that 800, not 900 million number and you whittle it down to we're only going to give you 830. And, but then the revenue comes in and only comes in like at about 745. So you see, this is where the problem comes from. We are making forecasts that have no basis in reality. How many years have we based a budget on what we expect to get from the buildup? Here's what I heard when I attended the buildup hearings. There will be a total of maybe 60 jobs created on Guam. The majority of the jobs will be transferred from Okinawa. That's the benefit to Guam from the buildup. Yeah, we're going to get a little bump on construction, but once we're past that construction, we might get a little bit of a buildup in the local economy at the fast food restaurants because we know the majority of the people coming with the buildup are going to continue to shop in Anderson and Naval Station. So. That's what I'm concerned about. My worry about this resolution, if approved, we're inviting the U.S. Congress to micromanage Guam. And I think that we need to show the U.S. Congress that Guam has evolved enough politically that we can handle our own affairs. And since this is the body that controls the budget, I don't think we need to have the U.S. Congress telling this body how we can handle the budget. I think this body right here can tell the administration last year total receivables for the government of Guam were $800 million. We're going to authorize a budget of $790 million for next year. That way if things get way out of whack, we're not too far out of whack and if at close to the end of the year we got in 840 instead of 790, we can maybe look at the possibility of doing supplemental appropriations for capital projects or something like that. It's not so much that 
this resolution is a good thing for Guam. The intent is good, but I think the intent state is with this body right here. What good does it do to pass a law that nobody follows? Well, I'm going to use your next resolution as a perfect example. We in the public didn't know we had the right on Public Law 24-222. Once we in the public learned that we had the right, we've been very adamant about defending our right. In fact, I'm going to be before the Superior Court later this week defending that right. Because now that we, the people, know we have the right to approve tax increases or to approve debt increases above 25 million, we kind of like that right, and we're going to keep that right. This legislature gave us that right. This legislature chose to ignore that right until recently. And in the process of ignoring the right, a few of us started wondering, what is this clause N that keeps appearing? And we did the research, and since then, we have been spreading the word, and the people like it. We like the ability, I bet the people in Puerto Rico wish they had a 24-222. They didn't. We do. And right now Puerto Rico is at 122% of their gross domestic product in debt. We're only at 86. We like it. We'd like to keep it at 86. So my, my testimony for both bills is this requires political will on your part. You have the power to enforce the law through the budget you approve, and I recommend that you take that power and seriously use it and use a, um, a cash accrual basis, using the previous year as an example, so that if at the end of the year you have a surplus, great. You could use it to retire debt or you could use it for capital projects. But this is where the power lies. This, in my opinion, is the most powerful part of government right here. Because you are our representatives and we're, we're when I say the people, a lot of the people that I'm talking with right now are happy to see the evolution in this body that we've seen in this session. We still have a long way to go, but we are seeing the kinds of things that we hope to see out of this body. And that's why I think the resolutions are not needed. What's needed is political will in this body. And we need more people to stand up, and then we won't need those. I understand why you're putting them in there, because we have laws on the books that aren't enforced, and because they aren't enforced, we're in the predicament we're in. But this is, you guys are the police. You guys are the ones that are supposed to keep the children in line. And when I say the children in line, I'm the guys that are running around. We can't be broke. We still have checks. You know, that's the administration. So that's my testimony on both. Thank you, Mr. Younger. I just wanted to, um, in light of your testimony, actually inform you that there was an amendment last week that was introduced and that passed by a majority of senators. I know. To strike 24-222. Yeah, but the bill didn't pass. That's correct. The amendment passed it. That's but right. But the bill didn't pass. And I don't want you to think that we're not paying attention to who's supporting different amendments, because we are. The, the, the reason why I'm raising that point, Mr. Leon Guerrero, is that in line with the, the resolution, the, per, the point of the resolution is to put these things into the Organic Act. So they cannot be taken away by an amendment on a bill or as a rider or as a separate piece of legislation mm -hmm. with just eight votes and a, and a signature of a governor. So I, I, and I, I appreciate the testimony that you're providing, but um, I think that it's kind of reinforcing the intent of the resolution. I, I understand the intent of the resolution, and what I'm trying to do is to get us to the next level, which is why are we the only territory without a constitution? You know, if we had a constitution and that was included in that constitution, but guess who drives that discussion and drives that argument? It's not Adeloup, it's you guys. You know, I mean, I've heard all, I've heard Adeloup talk, I've heard former uh, governors talk, but the people I haven't heard talking are you guys. You are the ones that need to be talking. Now, the reason why I think that a, a constitution is badly needed is just for the reasons why you're proposing these amendments, so that we can make laws 
for the good of the people that have a chance to endure and not be uh, notwithstanding out of existence. And I support that. But I think the better way to go would be for this body to get serious about our Constitution. Because if we're going to ask Congress to start reviewing laws about how we appropriate our tax collections, how we pass tax increases and debt bills, next thing you know we're going to be asking Congress to rule on, you know, uh, what qualifies for vesting in the retirement fund and what director, what level of uh, SUV a director of a government agency gets. Now, that's an extreme example, but when we start asking Congress to meddle in our affairs, where do they stop? You know, we are, we have evolved as a, a, an entity, and I say that I have the advantage of hindsight because I was gone for 28 years. The Guam that I left is so much different than the Guam I came back to, and it makes me proud because what I came back to was so good compared to what I left. And that's why I'm in this fight. I guess I've been in this fight now for 10 years, <laughs> going on 11. I've been in this since 2007 as a community advocate. And that's why I do what I do and why I testified on those two amendments the way I did. I like the intent. I like the reasoning, I like the thought purpose, but the only thing I don't like is the fact that this body is a, didn't have the political will to make those things reality. That notwithstanding was way too easy. And what did it do? You know, we transferred debt from the people to other people, you know. We didn't do our people any good, and like I promised earlier, I'll short answer. Thank you, Mr. Lungaro. Do any of my colleagues have any other questions for Mr. Lungaro regarding this resolution? If none, thank you for your testimony. We'll consider resolution 310-34 as being heard and move on to resolution 312-34, also introduced by myself. Similar to resolution 310-34, resolution 312 is relative to respectfully petitioning the United States Congress to enact legislation amending the Organic Act of Guam to include a provision of Guam Public Law 24-222 such that any provision enacted by the government of Guam which increases the public indebtedness of the government of Guam by at least $25 million, backed by the full faith and credit of the government of Guam, must be approved by a majority of votes cast in an election before any such borrowing can be undertaken. Again, this um, resolution is being introduced in order to memorialize the power of the people in the Organic Act that they should be the ones who are going to be ratifying whether or not any debt in excess of $25 million is encumbered. And this is very, very important given the financial circumstances, once again, that we're dealing with. Um, just yesterday, the administration had a press conference about $187 million in debt being put on credit watch. And it was uh, very interesting that um, this issue was being um, used to try and justify a tax increase on our people when in 2016, uh, two years ago, something even worse happened. The bond ratings of the government of Guam were actually dropped. They went down. And the rating agency that dropped Guam's bonds did so on a balance of $763 million. So here we are today with $187 million being put on credit watch and, and a whole lot of noise is being made about that with respect to the financial circumstances of this government. But two years ago, $763 million dollars in bonds were downgraded and nothing was said. It was swept under the rug. As a matter of fact, the rating agency that downgraded those bonds got kicked out by the government of Guam. The Guam Economic Development Authority kicked out Fitch ratings after they downgraded those bonds. That bond downgrade came with an explanation and I'm going to read that into the record. Fitch ratings downgraded these bonds in part because of operating performance, which reads, the government of Guam, back in 2016, has limited gap closing capacity and its operations could become distressed in a moderate downturn scenario. 
the government maintains limited reserves and, since it is near its debt cap, limited ability to use borrowing for budget balancing purposes, which it has done in the past. The government has delayed tax refunds for budget balancing and having brought these current with the issuance of the BPT bonds could again utilize payment deferrals for short-term budget balancing. The government of Guam has been attempting in recent years to reverse a 20-year history of operating a at a deficit. The current administration put into place a plan to gradually shrink the operating deficit by controlling expenditures, improving revenue estimation and collection, while using debt issuance to pay overdue tax refunds and other general fund expenses that in total had accumulated to $340 million. Between fiscal years 2011 and 2014, the government showed progress, gradually shrinking the operating deficit and bringing the budget slowly towards structural balance. However, ultimately, budget balance has not been reached. The negative fund balance has grown again to, no to $120 million as of the end of fiscal 2015. When unbudgeted expenses, accounting adjustments, and a revenue shortfall resulted in an operating deficit. Fiscal 2016 results are reportedly better, but details are not available. It is important to know that Guam's difficulty in achieving and maintaining budgetary balance has occurred during a period of economic growth while benefiting from growing revenues. Fitch ratings downgraded our bonds gave us a very realistic assessment of where we were in 2016, two years ago, and the response of this government was to not have any press conferences, not to call any special sessions. The response of this government was to kick Fitch ratings out the door. And now here we are in 2018. And, and from 2016 to 2018, after they kicked Fitch ratings out the door, what did this government try to do? It tried to go out and borrow a tram a loan on top of a loan after Fitch ratings gave us this very clear warning. And to imagine the crisis that we would be in if we had borrowed this tram today, with all of this financial crisis before us, with all of this credit watch all of a sudden being an issue, and the ironic thing is we're still in court fighting to not take out a tram borrowing. They kicked Fitch ratings out the door, they're trying to move forward Tran and taking us into court to try and make us borrow some more, while at the same time, ironically coming out and saying that this credit watch from S&P is reasons for us to force tax refunds onto our people. The only conclusion that can be drawn from all of this is that our bonds and our debt is being politicized far too much by far too few. We need to involve our people in this process. Public Law 24-222 empowered the people to be able to ratify whether or not they wanted to take on more debt. By memorializing this into the Organic Act, we will ensure that this power is retained by the people so that things like our downgrades by Fitch or this credit watch or whether or not a tran is, is supposed to happen or not will be something that our people will be able to decide and our politicians will be able to take one position or the, or, or the other and inform our people so that they can go in there and make an informed decision. Here we are today, financial crisis, and it was made very clear to us in 2016 that we were on this path. It's time for us to take certain local laws that are just repeatedly ignored, that are supposed to empower our people. It's time to take those laws and make those laws the law of the land in the Organic Act. And that's what Resolution 312-34 seeks to do. Um, I have no one who signed up to testify on this resolution. Mr. Leung Guerrero, you're still present. Did you have any other comments you wish to add? Just a short statement. I, like I said, I agree with the intent of this resolution. I agree the, that it, something needs to be done. That's why I'm in court right now fighting to defend 24-222. I think that it goes back to um, this body having the political will to do, to follow the laws they pass. And I hope that we, as we see new faces entering into this body, that they will have learned those lessons and follow accordingly. Um, like I said, I, the only reason I, I don't support the resolution is I, I think that we need to use this as part of the development of our own constitution 
this goes back to the conversations you and I had when you were uh, head of the tax commission, you know, if we had followed those recommendations back then, there's a very strong chance we wouldn't be in the financial predicament we are in today. It's tough being um, the uh, leader or the uh, f first person out there. As a friend of mine once said, the first person, you can tell who the first person is. They're the ones laying on the ground with arrows in their back, you know. So um, it's understandable why you introduced this following your, your history in this body right here. I just hope that this body evolves enough to the point where us running to the U.S. Congress, asking the Congress to protect the people from our own leaders won't be required in the future. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Leongura. There not being any further testimony, we'll go ahead and consider re Resolution 312-34 as being heard. Um, Senator Lee, did you have any questions for Ms. Leongura? Okay. Um, with that, we will go ahead and conclude this hearing, having exhausted the items on the agenda, and adjourn this hearing at 12.03 this afternoon. Thank you all very much.